Are you wondering what the steps are to actually purchase a house in Oklahoma? Well, you've come to the right place. My name is Marcy Billen. I am a real estate agent, and I want to take you through what I call the buyer strategy session. So I help a lot of people move to Oklahoma or move within Oklahoma. And I think everything is easier with a system or a process. Like you know what step comes first, what step comes next, and what the overview is. So this is that video. It is the overview. Now what I tell people whenever I do this buyer strategy session in person is that I am not expecting you to remember everything from the session because I do this every day and you don't. Not every real estate agent does a session like this. This is an intro session for me and I do it with every single buyer who wants to work with me. And the reason I do that is because it makes the whole process so much less stressful. I'm a big believer in having calm. I love systems, I love processes, and I love the calm. This process is already stressful enough without adding chaos because of contracts or not understanding something on top of it. So let's get into it. So the stuff we're gonna go through today is stuff about my team, how we operate, the contract itself, the overall steps, like the general steps, the buyer brokerage agreement, and then like the utility and moving stuff that I also have with this. If you have any questions, I tell my buyers to bring all of their questions to my buyer's consultation. I do this buyer strategy session either in person or on Zoom, and I do both all the time. Okay, so the first thing that we've got to look at is the breakdown of my team and how we operate. So this is us, this is our team, and I always give my new buyers pictures of us because honestly, you may not see all of us all the time and you wanna see who you're actually speaking to on the phone or texting with. So I'm actually down here at the bottom and I am a licensed real estate agent. My main job is negotiating with you, helping you get under contract for a house and finding you the perfect house. And then my husband, Handsome, and yes, that really is his name, Handsome. Here he is. But he goes to inspections, he goes to closings, he handles all that stuff right before closing that we may need done. And he also shows a lot of houses. And he's way more fun than I am, so you'll have way more fun with him. And then Jalen is at the top here. She is our director of operations. She makes sure everything goes smoothly. She handles a lot of transactions from contract to close, meaning getting all that paperwork in order because that is her strong suit and not mine. So next up during our buyer strategy session, I go over the, our buyer's resume. And here's what that looks like. Essentially, it gives you a little bit of history of who we are and what we base our values on. So we are a technology-based team. I love technology, I love YouTube, I love video. I sell a ton of houses to people who never see the house beforehand, which is kind of terrifying. Like a lot of them do come after they get under contract, but they may not see the house before they put it under contract. And I'll explain a little bit more about how you can do that um, whenever we go over the contract. So we're really focused on video and of course, researching prospective homes. And I do a lot of research on the market value of the home itself to make sure that you're not paying way too much or the home is underpriced and then you lose out on it. Other things that we can do, there's like negotiating home warranties and closing costs, paying, you know, the seller paying for your closing costs and the buyer sometimes paying for the seller's closing costs, just depending on the situation. So our background, like my background is mostly in sales. I was a personal trainer actually before I became a real estate agent, but that was a long time ago. And then I actually became a property manager first. Handsome has been a real estate agent before and he also worked in a lab before. And that means that he's pretty good at details. This page is my overview of my steps to purchasing a home. Now, the reason that I have an overview is because not everyone loves looking at the contract and not everyone has it memorized. I don't have it completely memorized, but I know most of it by heart. And this overview is gonna give you a good idea of the steps that it takes in order to get through a transaction in Oklahoma. I do work specifically in Norman a lot of the time. I work in other cities too, like Moore, which is just north of Norman. I work in Noble, just south of Norman. Blanchard, Tuttle, Newcastle. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City spreads itself out, so it's kind of weird. And then other places like Mustang and Yukon, Choctaw, especially uh, Midwest City, Edmond. These are the places that I work in, but I'm gonna be talking mostly about Norman because it's where I live and it's where I do a ton of business. So number one on our list of steps to buying a home 
is being financially prepared. So before we even meet in person, I ask people to begin speaking with a lender if they haven't already. I do have a list of lenders that I give to people. However, you don't have to work with the lender that I tell you to work with. Like that's not a thing. You can work with whatever lender you would like. It's important that you kind of know where you are with your credit history and your credit score itself. The pre-approval step, like talking to a lender is very important. If you're gonna pay cash, then you may wanna to talk to your financial advisor, depending on where you're pulling that cash from. If you're talking to a lender, you may still wanna to talk to your financial advisor, but you want to talk to someone who's gonna give you your options and kind of hold your hand through it, especially if you're a first time home buyer. If you're not, then I totally understand. But if you are, then you want someone who really explains your options. So ask a lot of questions. There are no stupid questions. Your lender is gonna talk to you about certain things, certain costs that you're gonna have. This is gonna include your down payment, the type of loan that you're getting, the appraisal. So your lender is gonna order the appraiser to come out to the house that you're purchasing. Like your loan officer will do that just as soon as you go under contract with that house. And then your loan officer will take that payment from you. Another upfront cost that you're gonna have is earnest money deposit. So your earnest money is held in a trust account, usually at the title company or at a brokerage, like a real estate brokerage, like the one that I work for. And we'll talk a little bit more about earnest money when we get to that section, actually multiple sections on the contract. Another upfront cost you may have is inspections. Now, inspections are not legally required and it is different from an appraisal. So just keep that in your brain, okay? And it's okay if you have to ask again, like don't worry about it. Usually for inspections, this is what we start with. We usually start with just a basic home inspection. It's a general inspection. This is usually gonna be in the price range of north of $300 and south of $600, just depending on the inspector that you end up choosing. I do have a list of inspectors. However, you can choose whatever inspector you would like. The inspector usually delivers a report to you. I love inspectors who have pictures and videos with their report, but you may choose one that doesn't have one and that's okay too. We also typically order a pest inspection right when we order that general home inspection. There are a few instances where we wouldn't order a pest inspection, like if the homeowner already had one done. Other inspections that we could order, and we're gonna get to this on the contract too, uh, roof, structural, HVAC. It just depends on the house and what you need as the new buyer. Then you're also gonna have closing costs. Your lender will walk you through what the closing costs could be, okay? So there are certain things you can shop for in closing costs and certain things that you cannot shop for in closing costs. I actually have a video that explains closing costs, so you may wanna jump over to that after you finish watching this video and I will link it below for you. Moving on to number two, because I can go on forever about number one, but we're going to move on to number two. So this is about hiring a real estate professional. So you want to find someone who you're really comfortable with. If you're comfortable with me, please give me a call. Like, that would be great. I'd love to work with you if you're moving um, to the Oklahoma City Metro. Let's do that. You don't have to work with me. You can choose whatever real estate agent you want to. It is very hard in our market to not work with a real estate agent. And if that's what you want to do, that is absolutely your choice. We are going to go over the buyer brokerage agreement together. Not every realtor uses one of these. I think they're extremely important and I'll go over why whenever we get to that point. I have a bullet point on here about for sale by owners. I do work with for sale by owners and all you have to do if you choose to work with me as a, you know, as a real estate agent is you say, hey, I wanna go look at this house. It's a for sale by owner. I give them a call because it's really easy to find their phone number because they list it on Zillow. And then I have a conversation with them and we kind of go through that process together. Most for sale by owners do wanna work with a real estate agent. Um, some don't, but we have to cross that bridge when we come to it. And then of course I tell people like go to open houses. If you're in the area or you already live here, that's fantastic. Go to an open house, go inside, take a look around. If you are working with me, you'd say, hey, you know, as you go in and there's a real estate agent there, you'd say, hey, I'm working with Handsome Wong. Everyone knows my dear husband. So that's why you're gonna say his name, okay? And if you're working with another real estate agent, you're gonna say their name when you go in. So that way, you know, that agent knows that you're spoken for, that you're already working with someone. But the reason why you go into open houses is to just get a feel for what you may like. And you may even fall in love with that house, who knows? Okay, number three on our list here is finding the right property. Now, it, to me, it is very important that you drive around to find the property that really suits you and the location that suits you the best for your life. 
So if you're working with me, then I'll set you up on a home search. If you know kind of the location that you want, if it's a spot within Norman, if it's a spot within Moore or Oklahoma City, then I can set up a search based on those locations and the price range and how big you want the house, etc. The best thing to do is to drive these areas, especially if you're not from the area. Now I have on here that you would pick out the 10 best homes from the list that I sent you. And then you drive those, you go and drive the neighborhoods, see if you like the neighborhoods, if they suit you and what you need. And then we schedule three to five showings in one day. We don't show more than five houses in one day unless it's like a true emergency, like you're coming in from out of town for one day and you really need to see 10 houses. But trust me, it's not fun to look at 10 houses in one day because they all just kind of run together. Three to five showings in one day is the best Way to get the showings done because then you're not so tired and then the houses don't run together in your mind so number four it's called making an offer and we're actually going to jump over from this bullet point you know section over to the contract itself and the reason we're going to do that is because i like going over the contract before we even go to look at houses and here's the reason they go fast guys your perfect house could get snapped up by another human being and we want you to have the chance to grab it. Ever since I started explaining contracts before we go out to look at houses, it just makes the process go so much simpler. And that way you get so many questions answered beforehand. So let's go over that contract. So when you meet with me to do a buyer consultation, this is part of the contract that I give you a blank copy of. So this is called the Residential Property Condition Disclosure Statement. Most houses that you go to look at in the country, I believe, but in Oklahoma, most houses that you go to look at are going to have one of these. So what is it? Well, it's a document that identifies any defects that the house may have. Who fills this out? The seller fills this out. It is for them to protect them from litigation at a later date. It's to protect them from being sued by you as the buyer. I look at a ton of these guys, sometimes like 10 a day. Not every seller fills them out the same. They look like they have a ton of information, but they don't necessarily. So I give you a blank copy so that way you can really look at what's on this and understand like, hey, what is an attic fan? Like I've never heard of that. Then maybe you can Google it and figure it out or ask me, most houses aren't gonna have an attic fan that you go and look at but they could have. <laughs> so let me show you my favorite parts of this disclosure statement. And they've redone it since last year, so <sighs> it's a little bit different than it was before, but more accessible, which is amazing. My favorite questions are numbers 11 through 24. And here are some of my favorite questions. Number 11 says, are you aware of any additions being made without required permits? Legitimate question, right? Are you aware of any previous foundation repairs? Legitimate question. We kind of want to know the answer to that. One of the questions on number 16 is how old is the roof and how many layers does it have? Normally roofs only have one layer here, but it could have two and we really want to know that. Has the property been treated for pests, for termites? And then are you aware of any defects with the septic or the lateral lines or anything like that? So these kinds of questions we really you know, want to pay attention to so that we can get them inspected if they did have problems before. So that's the property condition disclosure statement. This next one is the actual contract itself. So it's only six pages in Oklahoma because I've read <laughs> contracts from Texas and California and New York state and holy crap, those things are huge. Ours are very simple. So this is a standard contract. It's written by OREC, Oklahoma Real Estate Commission. So this first page isn't actually part of the contract. It is um, an acknowledgement and confirmation of disclosures. Basically what this says is that you've seen the property condition disclosure statement if the house has one, it may not have one. In that case, it would have a disclaimer form and um, it's a much simpler form, basically saying the seller doesn't know anything about the property. And then it could have a lead-based paint disclosure form if the property is older than 1978, because that is when lead-based paint um, stopped being manufactured and put into homes. And then this could also disclose to you if the realtor from your side, the buy side and the sell side are with the same brokerage meaning that it's like kind of double-sided, but we can go over that a little bit more on the buyer brokerage agreement. So the actual first page of this contract has a bunch of boxes at the top. And these boxes are to indicate what supplements are included with the contract. So if you're getting a loan, this is where we have to tell the seller what type of loan you're getting. 
I don't have any of the loan documents up here. I have videos explaining the FHA one and that kind of gives you the idea for the conventional one as well. The loan documents outline how much time you have to do things, like how much time you have to actually get pre-approved for your loan, which most people are pre-approved before they go under contract because otherwise sellers usually won't even look at your contract if you don't have that. You may have a house to sell and you need to sell it in order to purchase a new one. We would disclose that using another document here too. There's an HOA document that we might put on here as well. So there are some other documents that depending on the type of house you're getting, uh, where it is, what type of neighborhood, I would put some other documents with it, but definitely that loan supplement if you need it. If you're paying cash, then you don't have to have one. The main thing the loan supplement's gonna cover is what happens if your appraisal comes in low. I'm not gonna read every line of this to you because people don't like that. However, we have to hit the high points because you need to understand how the transaction works and this just lays out the transaction perfectly, the contract itself. So number one is the legal description and the property address, easy peasy. Number two is where the terms actually start. So we have three blanks, one for the purchase price, one for the earnest money, and one for where the earnest money is being held. For the purchase price, it could be the listed price of the house, totally could be, yeah, sure. I do a rough market analysis for nearly every house that I put in an offer for because we need to work together. You need to come to an understanding of how much you are willing to pay for a house because it is your money. Underneath that is a blank for earnest money. So I said we would talk about this. How much is earnest money? There is no set amount. It could be $500. It technically could be like 250, but usually what sellers won't take that. 500 is typically the least amount. And then, you know, sellers could ask for 1%. Sometimes builders will ask for 1%. A lot of times what we write in is a little less than 1%. So let's say the house that you're purchasing is $250,000. I will usually suggest to you between $1,500 and $2,000. This money, which is held in that trust account, is going towards your down payment at closing. Very rarely would you lose this money. And we'll explain why here in a second. Number three is the closing date, closing funding and possession. Usually our closings are between 30 and 45 days. Less if you're paying cash or you have a quick lender or you just really need to get into that house quickly. More typically than 45 days if the seller asks for it, which isn't uncommon. But it is ultimately up to you on what day you wanna close on your house. So, And that day is not set in stone, okay? Like, like it can move and it will, so just know that. Number four are things that if they're in the house, they're gonna stay with the house. The most common question I get is, will the stove stay? Yes, in Oklahoma, the stove stays with the house. Things that are, you know, a question mark are gonna be the refrigerator and washer and dryer. And then there also could be exclusion. So we can ask for things like the refrigerator, washer and dryer, uh, maybe like a playset in the back or something like that. I mean, there's a list of things that you can ask for. And then there's also things that we can exclude from the contract. A lot of times we do this because the seller wants to reserve things and they wanna take it with them. So they put those and I put those in the exclusions. Number five indicates a day. And that day is whenever your inspection period is going to begin. Usually I write mine to begin three days after an executed contract, meaning three days after signatures. Number seven has a blank on the A space as well. And this blank is to notify the seller how many days you're gonna have to do inspections. It could be a range of days. I've written as low as seven and as high as 20, but 20 is usually a no-go for people. On 7B, it has a non-exhaustive list of the types of inspections that you can get on your new home. So we covered the roof, home inspection, structural. There's definitely a list of things that you can get. When I say non-exhaustive, it's because anything is an inspection. I've had people, you know, drive by the house at 10 o'clock at night to see if, you know, there's like a party going on next door or something. It's your time to really figure out if the house is correct for you. Letter C is called Treatments, Repairs, and Replacements, TRR. I really try not to use the letters TRR. That's realtor speak. <laughs> we say that stuff all the time. We have so many little acronyms. I try to call out the repair list to my buyers. So after we get done with inspections, so let's say the inspections are 12 days long, and then on the 13th day, we have to give the seller the repair list. And we can actually end the inspection period sooner, but you know, the, by the 13th day, you have to give it to them or the day after your inspection period ends. The repair list is to point out defects 
with systems in the house that you would like the seller to repair or replace or treat. It is really important to remember that the repair list is for defects or malfunctioning things. It is not for anything that could be deemed cosmetic. I usually like to have my buyers pick out three to five items that are especially important to them because it's a very emotional and overwhelming time for sellers. You know, if there's more than that, then that's totally fine. But this is the time to ask for things to be corrected. Now let's return to that earnest money question, shall we? So here's how it works. You have until we have a signed repair list by both buyer and seller to back out of the contract and request your earnest money to be returned. I say request, uh, but you know, 99% of the time the seller is going to return that earnest money to you. You have to request it back on a signed document, which I always send, and then they have to sign it to release it. Now, if it's after the set time, like you already have the repair list decided on and then you back out, you might lose your earnest money, but it just depends on the contract and everybody involved. Another time that you could get your earnest money back is if the appraisal comes in low, meaning like you have a house uh, under contract for $250,000, right? But then the appraisal comes back for $240,000. So the bank's not gonna lend you the money for a $250,000 house in that instance. If the seller won't negotiate and bring the money down and you don't have the money to bring to the table to make up the difference, then you may have to break the contract. And there's each loan has a different amount of days that you can do that with it. Um, the same goes for any repairs that an appraiser may ask for. So it just depends on the situation. So that's another time that it's possible to get out of the contract and get your earnest money back usually. Another instance would be like if something happened and you couldn't get your loan. The biggest thing that I see happen, and I'm not, hopefully this is not a bad omen or anything for you, is that you lose your job. If you don't have a job, you can't get a loan. It's just how it works. If you have more questions on earnest money, please give me a call or go ahead and send me an email. So letter E says that you're gonna be able to look at any repairs, that the seller has done on the property that you requested and that you're gonna have a final walkthrough. So we schedule that for you typically and take you through that final walkthrough. And no, you do not have to be here in order to do your final walkthrough. Number eight is called risk of loss. So number eight outlines that the seller is gonna keep their homeowner's insurance on the property until the day of closing, and then yours will take over. Number nine says that once you sign the paperwork at the closing table, that property is yours and you cannot go back and ask the seller for anything else. Number 10 is covering some title stuff. So Oklahoma is a little bit different in terms of title. We do have abstracts in this state. It's really not gonna make that big of a difference for you. We're also not an attorney closing state. So that means like no attorney is directly involved in the transaction, though they do clear everything, but they're just always behind the scenes. So you never meet them. So the seller has certain expenses. And one of those expenses is to bring the title up to date surface rights only. We do have you know, mineral rights here in Oklahoma and usually they are separate from the property itself. The other thing that a seller has to pay for is a uniform commercial code search certificate. This looks for any liens on the properties that are not related to real estate. The buyer's expense is gonna be your title insurance. It is not the law that you have title insurance. There are so many reasons why I think that you should get title insurance policy on your property. It's a one-time fee, but you totally don't have to have it if you don't want to. Letter C outlines what kind of survey you want. So you can get a land survey or a pen survey. Usually though, we don't get these. These are very expensive between $2,000 and $5,000 and being very broad with that statement because things change all the time. You can get one of those. The most common thing to get is a mortgage inspection report. These are like a survey, but not one like a pin survey, but the county has it on file. The title company orders it. It shows you your easements on the property, make sure the setback line is good, all that type of stuff. Usually between $100 and $200 on your closing costs in order to order that. And then if you are paying cash, you don't have to have any kind of survey. So it's up to you. Letter D says that Theoretically, you have 10 days to look at title evidence if you want to. You don't have to learn how to read title. The attorneys do that and the title, the closers just make sure that everything is good with your title work. If there's anything wrong with title, so this is letter E, if there's anything wrong with title, the seller needs to correct it because they own it. 
And if they wanna sell it, that's what they need to do. I know this is so fun, guys. Thanks so much for sticking in here with me. Number 11 is covering some things, some other questions that I get. The number one question is taxes. They call property taxes ad valorem taxes on our contracts because that's what they call them on all contracts. It's attorney speak, that's what I call it. So ad valorem taxes or property taxes are paid in arrears in Oklahoma. That means that property taxes for the entire year are paid in the December of that year. So if you close on a house in June, the seller credits you the money that you would need to pay their part of the taxes. So it's prorated. The seller has some other things that they have to pay for, like dock stamps and tax things. If you buy a house that has a lease on it, then we would you know, have that deposit released to you at closing and then whatever prorated lease money that you would take be on there as well. Letter D is covering memberships. Memberships are really common out in rural areas. We don't have them very much inside like Norman or more Oklahoma City. HOA fees would also be prorated. Special assessments would be paid for entirely by the seller. I've only ever sold one property out of hundreds that had a special assessment on it. So usually not something we have to worry about and something the title company will let us know. Number 12 is covering a residential service agreement. This is a home warranty. Some people love home warranties and some people hate them. I take this on a house by house basis. If you have questions about this, it's something that I talk to my individual buyers about typically and what their needs are for their new house. Number 13 is any additional things that we'd write into the contract. I have a few things that I usually write in here, like where we're gonna be closing, what title company, and also that I don't work on Sundays or holidays. <laughs> 14, 15, and 16 on this contract are the fun attorney things. So any dispute that comes up according to the contract will go to mediation first, a mediation system. And then there says a lot of other stuff, but basically the idea is to not have any disputes come up within the contract. Number 17 is covering incurred expenses and release of earnest money. This is an A on 17. Anything that you order on the property before closing, you will pay for. So like your home inspection and your appraisal. 17B is covering the release of earnest money. So like I said, there is a special document that both parties have to sign in order to release earnest money. And that's how you request to get it back. And it has to be within 30 days of breaking a contract. But I usually do it that very same day. Number 18 is saying that you want your realtor to deliver contract documents for you. And number 19 is an IRS rule that has to do with some taxes and over the amount of $300,000. And if we're in that situation, then we can absolutely go through all of that stuff. Usually at this point of me explaining the contract, people are so done. So thanks for hanging in there with me. We didn't talk too much about how negotiation works. There are several things that can be negotiated out during the offer process and during the repair process and possibly during the appraisal process. So it just depends on the situation. Part of the reason I have this initial strategy session is to understand what you need as a buyer. If you need closing costs paid for, then I have to know that. And that's how we negotiate to get you what you need. Number 20 on this contract is the termination time. So usually it's a 24 hour turnaround time. Um, to hear back from the seller and it's not set in stone. So I'm sorry. That is the end of that contract. That is the overview of how a transaction is gonna work here in Oklahoma. So like I said, I do work with people that are wanting to move to Norman, maybe more Choctaw, Oklahoma City, Midwest City. I live in Norman. I work there a lot. So if you're thinking of moving to Norman or buying a new house in Norman or buying a different house in Norman, please give me a call. I would love to help you with that process. Okay, so next is the disclosure for the brokerage services. Now I technically am a broker. I do not have my broker's license, but I am a real estate associate. I'm a real estate agent. That means I work for my broker. I use buyer brokerage agreements because whenever you hire someone, there is a contract. There are expectations set up. And that is why I like these documents because it sets up expectations between me and the buyers that I'm working with. So let's get into it. So this document says that um, this is for a buyer brokerage agreement. This is also something that we would have for listing agreements if you were selling your house. I'm gonna go over this the way I always go over it with my buyers. So these are our duties and responsibilities. We treat all parties to the transaction with honesty, exercise, reasonable skill, and care. 
we receive any counter offers that we may get back when we write an offer. We write up offers and counter offers for you. So like even though I explained the entire, you know, document that you have to sign and say you understood, I'm the one who fills all that in. So you don't have to do any of that. And then I present everything to you in a timely manner. What this means for me is I usually send you a text message that says, hey, do you have time to talk? The last thing I want is for you to be going through the drive through at McDonald's and me call you and saying, hey, would you be willing to pay through? No, we don't wanna do that. We want you to be calm and focused on the situation and really understanding where your money's gonna go and what you're comfortable with. I really like to talk on the phone and not text through things. Each time you put in an offer, we give you an estimate of your closing costs and your bring to close costs. So this is including like your down payment and uh, what your monthly payment might be. Although my numbers will not be as perfect as your lender's numbers, they'll be pretty close. And then also all the closing costs that go along with the transaction. Biggest things that change the costs are gonna be insurance, which is something that you shop for, and your property taxes, which is something you don't shop for. We also keep a timely account of all monies associated with the transaction. This is usually earnest money. I really like to hold earnest money at my brokerage's trust account. Um, however, sometimes we hold the earnest money at the title company or the sellers, or I mean the listing agent's trust account. It just depends on the situation. Letter F says that we are keeping confidential information confidential. They don't need to know anything about you. There's lots of public knowledge stuff out there and they will look you up, so be ready for that. I'm not telling the seller if you're willing to pay more than what we wrote on the contract. I'm not gonna tell the seller if you're gonna do, if you could do a different type of loan or you could pay cash or something like that. It's none of my business and it's none of theirs. That's part of our confidentiality agreement. As a real estate agent, if there's something associated to the property that isn't disclosed on the property condition disclosure statement, then I'm supposed to disclose it to you on a special other document. This rarely happens, but it does sometimes. I comply with all of my licensing code because I am a licensed real estate agent in the state of Oklahoma. And sometimes it's possible that we could be double-siding the deal. That just means that like I could represent the buyer and the seller. Honestly, this doesn't happen very much. It used to happen a lot more. But if it does happen, then we have separate duties for buyer and separate duties for seller that are the same, but they're just separated. Number three doesn't apply to me and my brokerage. We don't offer fewer services. And of course, number four is just confirmation that you got these disclosures. So I know that was a ton of fun. So let's move on to the next one, which is going to explain how I get paid. And I know that's one of your big questions. So this is the actual buyer brokerage agreement. I use these because I think it's important to set up expectations. That's all. So number one, the purpose of this agreement is that you want to purchase a house. Number two is saying that you haven't signed this agreement with another real estate agent. The one under that is saying that you're not depending on me to pick out your house for you. Please don't depend on me to pick out your house for you. It's not a good idea. Number three is the duration of the agreement. I just listen to when you want to be in the house and write it for that long. If we need to go longer than that, and we're all still in good spirits and we all still wanna to work together, then we absolutely can. Number four is compensation of broker. I know this is your big question. How do I get paid as someone who's representing a buyer? So here's the thing. I charge 3% in order to help a buyer buy a house. And we can see from our multiple listing service, our RMLS, if a listing agent is offering 3% to a buyer's agent, because they don't have to. It's an antitrust law that we don't have a set amount, okay? Usually they offer 3%. So if the listing agent is not offering 3%, then basically what this says is that the buyer will make up the difference. So here's how it reads. Buyer shall pay the broker at closing an amount equal to 3% of the gross selling price. Buyer shall receive a credit towards the payment of broker's compensation in an amount equal to any payment made to the broker by any other broker or the seller. And this is what I write in the additional provisions. We'll let you know before we go into house, before we show it to you, if the listing agent is offering less than 3%. Here's the thing. Yes, I charge 3% if the listing agent is offering 2.5%. I almost never say anything. Like I, I have never said anything to a buyer about that before. The purpose of the 3% thing is that we need a living wage in order to survive and in order to pay our team and eat. So that's what that's there for. I'm sure you understand. If you have questions about it, please let me know. Um, you can give me a call or send me an email but usually, almost all the time, 
the listing agent is offering that 3%. And I keep saying listing agent because people typically don't understand that it's not actually the seller that's paying it, it's the listing agent that negotiates it. I know it's confusing and I know it's complicated, but that's how it works here in Oklahoma at least. So that means that usually 99% of the time, you do not owe me as your real estate agent anything for my service. Usually the seller pays. Number five is covering cost of services. So before something is performed for you, like a home inspection, you will know how much it costs. You're not gonna have any surprise bills, okay? Number six is saying that we could be working with other buyers who are interested in the same property that you are. That doesn't happen very much. Number seven, of course we are equal opportunity. Number eight, we went over this. If they're offering less than 3%, then we will alert you in writing before showing you the house. Like I said, it doesn't happen very much. Number nine, counterpart. So if like, if you're making this decision alone, then you would sign this alone with me. If you are making this decision with your significant other or your mom or your dad or your brother or sister, then you would all sign together. And then of course, anything you sign with me, you would receive copies of usually in a PDF form. And that's where all the signatures go. I told you that would be so much fun. It totally was. I have two other things that I usually give people whenever I'm doing a buyer brokerage agreement. So this is a moving checklist, just things that you don't want to forget whenever you're moving to a new house or a new state or a new town or whatever. And this is the utility directory. These are like all the cities that I typically work in. And this is how you would set up your utilities, the phone numbers and stuff like that. Like I said, I'm Marcy Billen. Thank you so much for going through all of that with me. I'm a real estate agent in Oklahoma. And if you need more help or you want to set up a buyer consultation with me, please go ahead down to the description and you'll find the link there. You're also going to find it here at the top. So you'll find a link where you can set up a buyer consultation so that we can talk together and go through this process together and answer all of your questions. I love questions.